probably start. Um, I am really happy to introduce to you today, be able to, to host uh, Yugana Onyekwe, and I hope I said that properly, um, who graduated in 1999. Is that right? That is right. Wow. A very, very long time ago. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Not a long time ago. Very <laughs> Just recently. And Yugana um, has a really amazing um, experience to share with us. He's been in a lot of different places from, uh, you know, uh, D1 NCAA basketball to music to fashion. And, uh, you know, he's really uh, doing it all. He's out in LA right now. And I'm going to let him tell his story. And uh, he's going to speak for a while, and then we're, we're going to er, uh, invite you guys all to uh, ask some questions. Um, and so think about what you might want to hear from Yugana. Thanks, Yugana. Happy to have you. My pleasure. Glad to be here and be part of this. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to give a brief introduction. I, I definitely want to give you guys the opportunity to ask questions and pick my brain um, for whatever is in it. Um, so, you know, I just want to open the floor to you guys to have a chance to talk. Uh, so, as Allison said, I uh, graduated in 99. Mercer's, I came from, originally from Nigeria and then grew up in London. So, coming to Mercer'sburg was my first experience of being in the States. And um, for me, it was, it was an amazing two years that I got to, to spend there. Um, you know, so much of what I was able to accomplish going forward wouldn't have been possible without the community and, and the people at Mercersburg. And that's something that I'm, I'm, I'm always grateful for. And so to have the opportunity to come back and talk to you guys who are currently um, in shoes that I was uh, a few years ago um, is, is it's kind of like a full circle moment. And uh, you know, I, I, I'm grateful for the opportunity. Um, after college, I went and I went, as I said, played D1 basketball at the University of Pennsylvania. I was then fortunate enough to play professionally. Didn't end up making it to the NBA, but was fortunate enough to play professionally overseas for eight years, played in Spain and Israel. So got to live in those countries, experience that culture. Um, afterwards, I moved back to New York City, um, pursuing music and entertainment, which is something that I've always been passionate about since I was a kid growing up. Um, and so that took me to New York and, you know, in between that as was developing that did a few other things worked in real estate for a while. Um, then ended up moving out here to LA probably about three years ago to continue to pursue music uh, worked at a label here in LA and was also DJing in Vegas uh, for half the week so I would be gone for half the week in Vegas and then come back to LA and um, did that for about a year, year and a half, or DJ back and forth between here and Vegas anyway, for about a year and a half. And then the pandemic hit and everything shut down, venues were closed, and it was kind of time to pivot. So found myself with a bit of time on our hands. Recently had a one-year-old daughter, a daughter who's one year old now, and um, my wife who's in fashion, and I had always thought about the idea of doing a line and when the pandemic hit, it was like, well, here's our opportunity to kind of do this. So we started a kids line about seven, eight months ago. And um, that's kind of where we are. It's developing and growing. We're getting, we've been doing direct to consumer the, um, initially, and we're now getting into wholesaling. We're in a couple of boutiques here in LA, which is an exciting and different transition, but um, you know, I've been in a lot of things, as you can see, have my, I've had my hand in lots of different things. I have lots of interests, but for me, it's always been centered around, you ask like what are all these different things have in common, but um, I think for me, I just love being creative and I love the creative process behind things. The idea of starting something from an idea that's in your head and then it ends up being a product that, or a service that people consume, whether it's the music that a song people listen to or clothes that people wear, or even something like basketball that's a sport, you know, it's, you think about all the creativity behind a lot of the sports that we play, maybe basketball, especially where the way people wear their uniforms or the way they have their hairstyles or how they play the game, the flair, there's so much creativity to it. 
So um, all these different areas for me, I think the thing that kind of ties them all in together is the ability to be creative and um, trying to pursue what I'm really passionate about and building a career and a future around that. And, you know, it's, it has, it's had its ups and downs as anyone who I'm sure as a creative will tell you, it can be a maddening experience where one day you feel like you're on top of the world and the next day you're like, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> Why am I putting myself through this? Um, but I think that's a lot of times that's the challenge when you're in the creative realm, just trying to um, um, stay even keeled through the highs and the lows and know that it's something that you're continually building, keeping your, your end goal in mind and focus so that you don't get too high with the highs and too lows with the lows, knowing that it's a journey and it takes time. And you know, there've been things that um, had to do in the middle of, of, of those certain seasons, whether it's work other jobs to kind of balance it out. Um, like I said, I worked in real estate, um, currently also working in insurance now as I, as I build out the fashion line. So, you know, it's not always smooth. You kind of have to mix it up a little bit, but at the end of the day, it's for me, it's always about finding, um, pursuing the areas that I'm passionate about and trying to stay creative in whatever I do. So I won't bore to you guys too much more with my speech. I really want to open it up for you guys to ask questions and, and like I said, pick my brain for whatever you might thoughts, ideas you might have, or things you want me to maybe try and touch on. Um, I could help it, and then if there's anything else I can talk about at the end, I'm certainly happy to do that. So I invite students to um, either just turn on your mic and, and shout out a question. It might get a little messy a bit. That's fine, or post something in the chat, and I will share that. What's up, Jamil? Long time no see, but Yeah, what's up? We're going on. Um, yeah. yeah, it's been a minute. Uh, I think the last time I saw you was in New York. In New York, yeah. yeah. This is so nice I, to see you too. Yeah, man. When I saw you were doing this talk, I was like, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta step in. <laughs> step this up, hit my man up, hit him up. Are you still in New York? Yeah, 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 of course. Hold it down. Yeah, so, man, you're on the other coast. Oh, sorry. We have a question about um, the name of your new fashion line and uh, a little bit about the concept <coughs> of that. Sure. Um, so I think I actually posted it there at the beginning before you guys came. So it's called Lil, Lil in Los Angeles. Um, and how it came about, as I mentioned, um, my wife and I are into, are into fashion. She works in fashion. She's worked in fashion her whole, her whole life. And um, we have a daughter who's 18 months now. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of cool kid stuff out there. But for us, it was just kind of like we wanted to do something that um, almost like adults clothes for kids in terms of the aesthetic. And for us, that's really been a focus. Every time we create something, it's like, would someone who's not a kid actually wear this? But we want it to be for kids. So we don't have like lots of frilly princessy stuff or stuff with dinosaurs or things that are you typically expect to see on, on kids' clothes. Uh, we try to make it like what's really trending and current in terms of streetwear and street fashion. Um, so right now it's a lot of tie dye. Um, figuring out slogans that are cool and stuff like that. And so that's kind of the, um, that's kind of where the, the, the initial concept for this came, came from. And I think we've kind of stayed true to that. I think, I think what, what always helps us know that we're online is when we put something out and people see it and it's, it's like, oh my gosh, I love these. Do you guys make this for adults? Then we're like, yes, okay, we know that we're, we're, uh, we're on, on target with where we want to be in terms of demographic. And we've, you know, we've primarily been selling direct to consumer now. We're just kind of starting to go into wholesale with a few boutiques. So that's given us the opportunity to really get real-time feedback um, from people who see it day-to-day. -day. Like we sell at a couple of um, um, the markets here in LA, like uh, on the Pilsen Central, uh, Mel Melrose Trading Post, we do, we do Grand Central Market, which is downtown. So that's been really important for us in terms of getting real real time feedback from people and seeing how people react to the products. Hope that answers the question. 
Um, as we were, we, you and I were talking at the beginning, um, I, I, it occurs to me, we were, we were talking about how students really feel like they are, um, you know, they have only one course of action and you've done so many things. Um, mm -hmm. how, how, what would you say to students today who, who feel like they don't have many choices? How, how, what should they know about being able to take risks and, and pursue their interests and passions? Um, I think that taking risk is an, is an important part of it. Um, but I think that for me early on, you know, if I had to do it all over again, I would have been a bit more calculated in taking some of those risks. Um, and by that, what I mean is if you, if you have something that, you know, I come from an African background and some of your international students, they come from other cultures where it's education, education, education. I don't want to hear about some of the other stuff you're trying to do, go get your education, then you can do that stuff. Um, and so, but I think my parents were a little more forgiving in that aspect in terms of allowing me and my siblings to, to explore creativity. And so I think it's finding that balance where um, if you have something you're passionate about, finding a way to make time for it, even though it may not be your main thing right away. So if it's fashion, if it's music, you know, you may still be going to school pursuing your education or you may still have to work a nine to five and do what you have to do but slowly but surely like i said before it's it's a build it's something that you you, you try to make a long-term thing and you build towards so you know maybe it's like okay i work my job i go to school on the weekends um i'm gonna go try and find manufacturers or i'm do i'm gonna do my designs or i'm a, i'll work on my music and then um Put it out there that's the other thing put it out there even if it's in a small test group you know test it with friends and family um test it at small locations where you can go sell or where you can release your music to whatever it is that you create i don't i don't know but always make i guess make space for your gift some way or somehow don't be like oh well i can't do it 100 percent of my time now so it's not even worth it if you can devote 20 percent of your time to it um it'll just start to grow, it'll just start to build. And then you'll see if there's actually something there as time goes on. And if you can actually make that the thing that's your, your full time thing, or if it's something that just brings you passion, you know, I think we underrate sometimes just the joy we get out of being able to do something that we love and how that brings balance to our lives. So it may not be something that you en ends up being your full time career, but if it's something that brings you joy and gives you a creative outlet, that in itself is worth a lot. So basically you invented the side hustle, sounds like. I definitely did not invent it. I've done it to varying degrees of success one way or another. Uh, but like I said, I'm still kind of figuring out myself and still on my journey. Um, and but yeah, I, I, I'm definitely on, I'm definitely Mr. Side Hustle in a lot of respects. <laughs> So we have a, a question in the chat um, wanting to get some advice about starting. Where do you start if you're interested in starting a fashion business? Um, that's a great question. And I think we were fortunate enough to have um, a friend who was already in the space and he kind of opened the door for us in terms of um, his um, production line. So whether it was people to do screen printing or um, manufacturing, stuff like that. Um, and being in LA obviously made it a lot easier because we live in downtown LA where literally so many fashion brands are out of here. Um, but I would say that even if you're not, regardless of where you are, I think in today's um, world, you don't, you don't necessarily have to be in a certain place. You just have to have a great idea and find a way to implement it. But, um, you know, depending on what you're trying to start, if it's something where it's street where there's so many, you know, you can start simple. You can start with t-shirts, you can get blanks. There's companies that do a really good job in terms of providing blank t-shirts that you can go tie dye on, that you can go print, sweats, you know, all these things like Bella Canvas, for example, is a great company, Next Level, um, Lane 7, you know, I'm happy to share some of, some of these with you, <clears throat> for those of you who are interested in that. And you can literally um, 
you know, get a wholesale license, which is free in most places, um, buy some of this stuff on wholesale. And then if you do the design yourself, that's cool. You can go ahead and do that or find someone who screen prints or find someone, um, a dye house that, tie, that tie dyes um, and then, or does embroidery, uh, you know, you can get blanks of all these different things, get them wholesale. And then really from that point, it's just, it's, it's marketing. It's really, um, you know, creating space online, um, creating the story that you want to tell with your clothes. And like I said, starting small, starting small, test stuff out, um, see what works. I really recommend trying to find a way to sell directly to people because the feedback you'll get is instantaneous and you'll know right away what works and what doesn't. Test it with friends and family, people close to you and start small, start small and then kind of grow from there. Um, you know, but if anyone, you know, I'll share some, some resources, places if people wanna know where you can get stuff to kind of get started. Um, I'm happy to share that as well. Ugana, I, I have a question for you. You know, the, the things you've done, it kind of scares me. You know, I'm kind of a person who likes to, to do one thing. And, you know, where does your confidence, where's your confidence come from to, to be able to pursue your, your interests, whether they're 20% of what you're doing or, you know, 100%? Um, I just think that, you know, and, and I think, it's something that scares all of us. Honestly, there's times that I, like I said earlier, like I do things and I kind of go back and forth in my mind as exciting and exhilarating as sometimes there are days like I should just have a regular job and know where my paycheck is coming from and know what I'm doing and is this really worth it? But um, the other thing that kind of nags in my ear is this thought that like, I don't want to ever look back and have that regret that uh, I should have done this. Why didn't I try that? So I think the fear of regret is a lot of times for me often bigger than the fear of trying something out. And honestly, over time, the more I've kind of done things, the less that fear is there. Um, Cause you know, you do things and a lot of times you'll fail. I failed a lot. I failed a lot of stuff. And a lot of times you'll fail. But I think once you kind of get over that hump, once you failed a few times and you're like, okay, I got to start again. I got to rebuild. It, the next time you're not as fearful, you're not as scared. You know that if you fail, you're not going to die. It's no one's, it's not brain surgery or no one's lives are at risk with a song or clothes or fashion. You know, no one's going to die. We might fail. We might have to pick ourselves up and dust ourselves off and um, recenter and start again. But uh, these are not life or death issues we're talking about here. So um, for me, it's just try and if I fail, I try to learn something from whatever I do. That's the most important thing. So as I move to the next thing or I move to something different or I pivot and reorient, it's like, okay, what did I learn from this failure and this mistake that I can take moving forward and um, hopefully grow and not do the same thing again. But don't be afraid to try things. Don't be afraid to try things. I think that's, that's the key takeaway from this because you're gonna fail. And if you go into the mindset knowing that, you know, this might fail, it might not work, I'm gonna fail sometimes and be okay with that, um, it won't paralyze you from taking action. So we have another uh, chat question about how um, your exposure to so many different cultures uh, throughout your life has really impacted you and what kind of perspective has that given you? Um, it's a great question. For me, it's been invaluable. I can't even, it's not something that I can even really quantify. And I feel really, really blessed to come from where I've come from and have been able to live and travel all over the world. Um, and that, that informs a lot of my thought process, the way I kind of view the world, the way I relate to other people. Um, and even if, you know, we may not all have the opportunity to travel or go live in different places, but I think really exposing ourselves as much as possible to different cultures. I mean, we live in a country where there's every culture under the, every, every, everyone is represented in the United States, which is an amazing thing. But I don't think that everyone takes advantage of trying to, I wouldn't even say immerse because immerse is, is a big commitment, which is great, but just even trying to relate and build connections with people who 
are from different cultures, different worldviews, and and you know, it's not everything that you necessarily accept or subscribe to, but when we have those relationships and we communicate with people and we at least understand, we get a perspective of where they're coming from, we get a perspective of different cultures, how people view things differently. And um, I think that that in itself is, is something that um, has been an invaluable experience for me. Obviously, I've been fortunate to live different places and all those things have poured into um, my sensibilities, whether it's with music or with fashion or whatnot, to a certain degree. So I'm always a big advocate for people um, being open and exposing themselves and inviting um, other people, cultures who look different, talk different, do things differently. Um, I just think it gives you a different perspective, whether or not you agree with the way things are done or not, but just being exposed to and having that perspective, I think, um, is important. Yeah, Ugona, um, I would be I'd be interested to hear you talk a little bit about um, your experience with basketball, um, you know, on the uh, on the international uh, level, because I think it's it's interesting just for just for for folks to hear, because everybody you know sort of like NBA, but they really have no idea what it's like playing overseas and and how that reception can be received and and on all of that stuff. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, coming out of college, you know, for me, I, I was probably with a similar mindset. I mean, my, my goal from, the, from when I started playing basketball as a young age was NBA. That's what I, that's what I watched on TV. Um, you know, in Nigeria, I saw Haki Bajuan, who was in Nigeria in the NBA. And I was like, oh, wow. You know, he was like my first person. I was like, wow, if he can, if someone from here can make it, then that, why can't I? And, that was always kind of my goal, what I worked towards. Um, and I was fortunate enough, I had the opportunity to try out for a bunch of teams coming out of college. And a few years after that, playing summer league and whatnot, I never ended up in it. But, um, you know, this whole other world of playing in uh, other countries was opened up to me. And um, it was something that I just kind of embraced and jumped at. Like I said, I love the opportunity to travel and live in these different countries. Um, Spain and Israel were two amazing places to just kind of live and be. And basketball overseas is, is, is huge. Um, I think Spain is the second biggest, um, second best league in the world. Um, and there's multiple tiers. It's not like here in the States where you just have the NBA, you know, you go to these countries and they have league one, they have league two, they have league three, almost like I do with soccer. Uh, for those of you who are familiar. And so even if you're not the highest talent, a lot of times you can go um, and play at different levels and still experience these, these countries and cultures. Um, and everywhere, everywhere is very different, you know, even from city to city, team to team. Some teams are really good and professional with stuff. Other teams are <laughs> kind of bootstrapping and figuring it out. So uh, sometimes it can feel like the wild, wild west. But again, it's just kind of, it's all part of the experience. and um the fans they're amazing um you know they they really love them and they're passionate about basketball even somewhere like israel where you wouldn't necessarily expect um, you know games are televised people see you in the streets run up to you um if you lose a game you probably don't want to go out for a few days because you'll be in the supermarket shopping shopping for groceries it's not like here you know like if you lose a game and you're in the store shopping people will come up to you and be like what happened why did you lose the game no, no, no. like talking to you like it's like okay it was a game gonna play again tomorrow but yeah that's but that's just the passion people have about their sports and uh, again like a cultural thing that's really different i thought was really funny who literally come up to you and be like what do you do what happened why why did you do this game? why did why didn't you why did you score more why did you shoot why did you do this i was like okay thanks i got you i got you next game <laughs> but yeah um i i i love those experiences i love again it just gave me the opportunity to travel and see the world and um, there, there's, there's markets out there, huge markets, and um, basketball overseas is a, is, a, is a great outlet. And it's not so people don't just have the option here, but there's all these different other places we can go and, and do this and be successful and build something. Um, we have a question about how did you end up at Mercersburg and what made you choose Mercersburg over other schools? 
Um, yeah, how did I end up? In, so I ended up in Mercersburg. I was actually recruited. So um, our coach at the, the coach in Mercersburg at the time was Tony Tucker, and he had a relationship with. Oh, he didn't have a relationship. So a coach at Long Beach State, which we were talking about earlier, Allison. Um, a coach, I was playing for a team in London called the Brixton Top Cats, uh, junior team. And my coach from Brixton knew a coach at Long Beach State, which is out here in California. And so that coach knew Tony Tucker, who was the coach at Mercersburg. And so they were heavily recruiting me and but they wanted me to go to prep school for a year. And so that's kind of how the relationship with Mercersburg started. Um, you know, I think the, the basketball program at that time was a real focus um, with, with what Tony was trying to do. And so we had probably about what, six or seven D1 players at that time. And um, that's how I, that's pretty much how I ended up at Mercersburg. Didn't end up going to Long Beach State, which is a whole other story um, in of itself. But that was how I ended up in Mercersburg. So the school, I guess the school kind of chose me, not so much I chose the school. I didn't really have the options on the table at the time. And um, at talking with Tony and getting here and seeing what they were doing with the program, it, it was, I don't know if I would have made another, a different choice anyway, if I had other options. It was, it was great, great for me. I'm, I'm sure that there are students too who would like to hear about um, some of your musical um, endeavors and, and what that was like. What was that like at the time of your life? How did you get involved in that as well? Again, it's, it's such a, an interesting thing. Yeah, um, so I grew, up, I grew up playing the piano, uh, classically trained when I was young. Uh, my parents were both, they both loved music. None of, they weren't musical in terms of playing instruments or anything, but they had huge collections. And so um, my mom was really important to her that we, we all played one instrument or the other. Um, and so that's kind of how it got started. And then as we got older, we're involved in choirs at church and stuff like that. Um, and I think it was in my early teens, I kind of discovered music production. I didn't really know that was a thing, I didn't even know how it worked, but I um, actually remember how this happened. It was actually while I was at Mercersburg, I was still doing piano and I was doing drums at the same time. And I think it was around that time that um, Monica and Brandy's song, The Boy's Mind came out. And it was like the huge, the best, biggest song that year. It was like number one for however many weeks. And I was just so fascinated by the actual music, the production behind it. And, I, and that's when I started researching, I was like, how did this how did this song come about and i discovered rodney jerkins who was the producer and i was like oh what does the producer do and that was literally how i started learning about production i was like oh that's that's kind of cool that that's what i mean because i'm not a singer i'm not necessarily like a band type of person who wanted to be in a band but i was like okay so that that's how i could kind of do this and create and be involved and that's kind of how my journey in production started. Um, and so even while I was at college at Penn overseas, I would always have like my little studio set up. Um, I used like my first check that was supposed to be meant for my um, meal plan at, in college to go buy a keyboard. So I had to figure out a way to eat and get into the dining hall for free. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, that was kind of my foray into music production and something that, like I said, for me, it's, it's always followed me. It's, it's just what I'm passionate about. So whatever else I've done, music has always been a part of it, a part of my life. And then after basketball, it was like, okay, let me go to New York. I've always wanted to live in New York. It's a big music center. Let me see if I could actually make something of this. And um, was there for a few years, uh, pursued it to varying degrees of success, never really got a chance to break into the industry, then moved out to LA um, because there was kind of a shift towards LA being the center of the music world here. And 
got out here and then after a year or two was fort fortunate enough to get in at a label, one of the labels here, um, working there as an engineer at one of their studios. Um, and then I was also, you know, I'd also picked up DJ over the course of the years during that time. And I had a connection with someone in Vegas who worked at one of the casinos there, the hotel groups there. And um, he was able to get me, help me get um, a few gigs DJing there at a couple of their venues. And so I started like, commuting back and forth to Vegas three nights a week and then back to LA and working at the studio when I was back here in LA. That's kind of, but you know, all through this period as well, also releasing music independently, working with other artists independently, helping them develop their projects and our, some of their projects. And um, so it's, it's always, had, always has been and always will be something that I do so in one capacity or another, because ultimately something that brings me personal joy. Um, it would be great if I made a living doing it, but at the same time, there are times I have done that and there are times I haven't, but regardless, it's still always gonna be a big part of my life. Somebody else out there have a question? My, fa my favorite song I've produced. Um, hmm. I have, some, I have stuff that's up on Spotify, but there's a song I did with another, another artist um, called Maya FN. Um, it was like a remake of an of a, uh, a 80s song by New Edition. Can you stand the rain? But it was so we kind of reworked it and made it into a more contemporary version of that song, um, and that's one of my favorite songs ever. Actually, so I, I came up with this concept to kind of uh, make it a song that's contemporary and relevant to this area in terms of the production and and the way it's sung and performed. And so for me, that that's probably one of my favorite songs. Um, it's my, uh, I'll put the name of the song if anyone cares to go listen to it. I'll check it out later on Spotify and all the. Um, so we have another question here. Were there any um, classes that you took at Mercersburg um, that helped to feed these interests? Um. U.S. history, no doubt. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me see. Yeah, you know, Mercersburg was really awesome in terms of encouraging and allowing us to really explore and tap into the things that, that we were, that we expressed interesting. So, you know, I think at the time I, I was doing piano and I was doing I had an interest in drums and I hadn't really played drums and I started doing drums and I, it, wasn't, it wasn't necessarily even really a class that was offered, but um, the music department, you know, I, would, I think for a while I was actually going off campus um, to go do that, but it was a course, it kind of towards like my credit. So, um, you know, then some of the art classes as well were getting things that fed my creativity, but, you know, I, I just remember it that Whatever we were interested in, there was a way to kind of accommodate it and the faculty and staff would really, really encourage us and, and, and push us to kind of pursue the things that we were interested in. Um, so it was really a well-rounded overall kind of experience in education that I think we got. And of course, US history, can't forget that one. You know, Gona, um, you know, just listening to your talk and first of all, thank you so much again for, for doing this. This is like really cool. Um, uh, the different, you know, kind of areas uh, that your journey has taken you on from basketball, sports, um, you know, a, a truly, you know, from a global perspective, some of the highest levels. Um, and then coming back to the States and, and hopping into music, uh, finding your way from real estate to music and 
uh, and now, you know, into fashion, you know, um, I was saying this to some, some, some folks the other day, life is not linear um, in no way, shape or form because um, you couldn't even predict it, your yeah. path and what it was going to look like. But like what, one of the things that really kind of stands out from, from your share is just these, these industries are, it's like the network um, and the people that you meet along the way that in essence push you forward into you know uh, getting closer to that to that to that place that you can occupy I mean basketball Mercersburg with the Long Beach coach and then Tony Tucker and then you end up at Mercersburg to then you know music and how you found you know your connections through music but now in the fashion space you know like um, you know could you can you speak a little bit about you know, the importance of networking and, you know, how that has really impacted, you know, your journey. Yeah, and that's, that's, a, that's a really, really good point. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I, I think that it cannot be under, overestimated, I should say, the importance of, of network. And I would say not just, not just building a network in an in authentic way, but I think, um, really actually firstly finding a way to add value to other people um, and, and being a resource to people, even if it's just not even a tangible thing that you're giving them, but just whether it's relationally, being, being a friend, being an ear that they can listen to. Um, I think that that is what ultimately down the road has opened for me so many doors. Um, you know, a lot of times, I think of how I ended up at the label. That was through a personal relationship. Um, whereas I had also applied for tons of other things that I didn't get similar positions, but because I actually had a relationship with someone that initially I didn't even know they were, they worked at that label. We just had developed and struck up a friendship. And then over time when an opportunity opened up, um, it kind of gave me, gave me a foot in the door there. Um, the, my gig in Vegas, um, that was through someone, a teammate of mine that I went to college with and who has been one of my best friends over the years. Um, I think when you know, you're know you at a place like Mercersburg or you go to college and the, the people you meet there, or even people you grew up with, you, you never know where, how relationships will develop over time. But again, I, I definitely wanna stress not not doing things with an ulterior motive, just really being genuine and just trying to add value to people. Um, in as much as you know, you're 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 trying to um, develop those relationships, uh, but really not burning bridges as you go along along the way. Um, you know, because you never know when um, you might need someone from some from someone, or when a relationship is going to come back full circle. You know. Then there will be times when you will have disagreements or you won't see eye to eye with people, but just don't don't burn the whole thing thing down. Sometimes it's best to just kind of walk away and be like, okay, that's fine. I I, I may have more to say on this, or I would I feel angry in the situation or may would react a certain way, but I'm just gonna leave it and let it be and just walk away from it. Um, because you know, that same person may very well not even know how they may have offended you or done something wrong they may be see from a different completely different perspective and it'll come it, it'll come back full circle right um but yeah i think it's really important to really invest in invest in other people um and again not always seeking something right away but just generally try to invest in other people and and see how you can add value to them and you know down the road those relationships will just kind of pay themselves back and it'll 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 be worth it in the long run yeah, you, you can't you can't overestimate the importance of network and the relationships you build at a place like Mercersburg or you know when you end up going to college or some of these other places you'll you'll have the opportunity so constantly be invested in other people and the relationships. Yes, you know I would also add uh, just for 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 folks that are listening. I didn't know we were gonna. I graduated in '93. He graduated in '99. We didn't overlap at all, and it wasn't until he came to New York and and looked me up. 
and we connected. Um, and of course, it was like Mercersburg, no doubt, questions, no question, what do you mean to me? Come to my office, whatever. And, you know, and he came to my office and we sat, we chilled, we, we cut it up. And I was like, how can I help? What can I do? You know, and so it's just, you never know who's going to hit you up. And it's not the networking is not necessarily you having to be the one that's actively networking, but you can yeah. be the one that's being hit up to be networked. So, you know, being open on both sides is really, really important. And so, I mean, we're a perfect example of that. So here we are, exactly. however many yeah. years later. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and so case, you, case study right here. We have to connect Udana and Sayir because they don't know each other and they're in the same space. In the oh, same for place. sure, yeah. 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 Sayir right. was, uh, yeah, for sure, we can definitely do that. You gotta hit. You gotta, I gotta get your contact though. I don't know. Your your stuff has changed. You're constantly in motion. <laughs> we, can, we can get the alumni to do it. So um, yeah, yeah, and 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 oh, Renee Hicks is saying that the Mercersburg app is still a great way to connect with Mercersburg, and uh, also the you know, gosh, the social media sites. Yeah, I think we have about time for one more question before uh, we have to send people off to class. Would love to. Wrap it up with something. I'll take the plunge. Uh, God, <laughs> uh, this is Quentin McDowell. This is year 14 for me at Mercersburg. I'm one of the faculty members here. Great to great to see you. And thank you so much for being willing to do this and to share your story. And, you know, I guess, you know, knowing that this is a student centric uh, conversation, you know, what advice do you have? What would you would you pass on to this next generation of Mercersburg kids and uh, to help them kind of feel that same courage and confidence, be willing to take those risks to, to just engage and, and be uh, wherever they are fully. Love to hear that, your, your, your words of wisdom. Um, yeah, I, th I think the main thing, like I, um, I don't know if I said it before, but Mercy of the Perk offers so, 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 so much. And I think the the further away you get from it, the more you appreciate it. I think a lot of times when we're in the middle of something, especially when we're young, we don't like really, we're not really aware or take care of it, but you get out in the real world and then you see other situations and you're like, wow, I really, I really had a good thing there. So I really wanna encourage you guys really take advantage of all the resources that you have at your disposal at a place like Mercersburg, um, whether it's the relationships, whether it's, it's the, um, the stuff you get to study, the, the, the places you get to travel, all the things you get to do that the school really works hard at providing, um, really jump into those and, and embrace them. And again, like I, I said, just for my life, don't, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of failure. Don't be afraid of trying things. Um, take calculated risks, yes. I probably, Doing it in hindsight would have been more a bit more calculated about some of the risks I took, but um, again, that was that was part of my learning curve. Like, um, but take calculated risks. Don't be afraid to start small and grow things and develop. Um, I think we live in a world and uh, generationally now, um, everything. It seems like things happen overnight. It seems like things happen overnight, and when we see things on social media or we see things on TV, we we a lot of times the backstory and the journey isn't communicated. And it's like, oh, wow, they just started this thing yesterday and now they're super successful and they have a hundred million followers or they have a, a billion dollars. And it seems like they started yesterday, but no, there's, there's a journey that often, does the, that often doesn't get communicated in the middle of those stories. And um, so I, I think that um, for each of you, as you're young and you're aspiring and you're growing, just understand it's kind of brick by brick you know, think of it like you're building a house. You might put down five bricks today. Tomorrow you might get caught up and only have a chance to put down one, um, but know that you're building something that's the course of a lifetime. So 20, 30, 40 years from now, you'll, you'll have a house that's kind of done, but it's taken time. And some of you will do it in a month. Some of you will do it like in a year, Every, but everyone's journey is different. You know, try not to compare. That's another thing, comparison will, will kill you. <laughs> You know, learn from people, obviously talk to people as much as you can, um, use the resources available, but know that your own journey and your own path is your own. No two people are the same. And that's, and that's a great thing. That's a beautiful thing. So um, if someone 
does it quicker than you, that's fine. Maybe you're just gonna, you're gonna take a little longer. Maybe you're gonna do it a different way. Comparison is thief of joy, exactly. That's, that's, the, that's the phrase I was looking for. Um, so just run your own race, run your own race and take advantage of everything that's, that's available to you. That's awesome, thank you. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today um, and, and really to share with us and reconnect. And you know, this is a valuable uh, network that we have and glad that you are, are being a part of it. So um, yeah. I'll, um, I'll also, I'll put my email in the, in the chat if anyone didn't get a chance to ask questions or whatever. Um, you know, feel free to hit me up. Um, you know, I'm always happy to, to chat if we need to jump on a call or text or whatever as well. You know, I'm happy always to connect with people. So feel free if anyone didn't get a chance to ask whatever they needed today or there's people who weren't able to jump on and want to reach out. Anything I can do for the community, happy to be a resource for what it's worth. <laughs> it's worth a lot. <laughs> it's worth a lot. Um, thank you all, um, students. Um, you can go. Um, have a great afternoon, and you have uh, Yugana's uh, email contacts should you wish to reach out. So, right. Jamil, I'm gonna get your info or send me your, get me an email. Chocolate yeah, I got your email. Ketchup. Okay. Yeah, I got your email. I'll send. I don't know if I have the same mobile, but um, that you that I have for you in my contacts. But I, I'll, I'll shoot it to you right now. Okay. Yeah, and anyone else, feel free to hit me up, please, anytime.